Let me know if you've heard this one before. And in a move that could shake up the college football world, Big 12 powerhouses, Texas and Oklahoma, have reportedly reached out to join the SEC. Absolutely everything is Conference different. Realignment. 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 And that offseason was dominated by conference realignment. Conference realignment. It's all around us. And contrary to popular belief, it's been happening forever. But something is different with this modern type of realignment. Teams have always moved around because of money. Yes, even before NIL, schools cared about money. But where the concern used to be finding a place your team could play that was affordable and would give them the best chance to compete, now it's being driven by the desire to increase ratings to make as much media money as possible. This has led to trash talk between fan bases moving away from what happens on the field and instead focusing on just how great your media rights deal is and how poor the other school is in comparison. But that's not what this video is about. If you want to continue to scream into the eternal void, Elon's Twitter is still kicking. This video is going to look at the results of those moves and inevitably how moving conferences will send your team down the crapper faster than you can say Taco Bell. Okay. This is going to focus exclusively on power conferences and power teams. This isn't me saying that non-power teams don't matter. I'm just trying to keep the timestamp bearable. With that out of the way, we've got to find a starting point. And, like everything in the primordial hellscape that is college football media, it all comes back to Oklahoma. The landmark decision in NCAA versus Oklahoma changed everything in college sports. Following this 1984 ruling, athletic conferences could now independently bargain for competing media rights deals. This started an arms race of conferences gathering whatever schools that could increase their overall value and hopefully diminish the value of their competitors. The board was set, battle lines were drawn, and who would be the first ones to start it off? The Southwestern Giant and reason why Americans are constitutionally required to own three rifles and 10,000 rounds of ammunition. The Hogs. 30 to 50 feral hogs say. Legit question for rural Americans. How do I kill the 30 to 50 barrel hogs? In 1991, the SEC added football independent South Carolina and Southwest Conference powerhouse Arkansas. The overwhelming sentiment of the move was that Arkansas wanted to join the big boy club increasing their visibility and media valuation to rake in buckets of money in a move that led to the eventual demise of their historic home, the Southwest Conference. Prior to the move, the Hogs were regularly one of the top dogs in the regional conference, boasting 13 conference titles going back to back in 88 and 89, along with one claimed national championship in 1964 and an unclaimed one in 77. After the move, Arkansas has yet to win a conference title and a team that was regularly ranked and dominant in their region has only reached bowl eligibility 18 of their past 32 years in the SEC. That's just 56%. Some of you might be saying, hey, that's not bad, that's still above 500. To that I say, is that why Arkansas changed conferences to just be above 500? Let's move to the 2000s. It's 2004. Some guy named Mark started up a website called The Facebook. W's back for round two Electric Boogaloo. And Big East Powers Miami and Virginia Tech are jumping over to the ACC in a move that'll eventually doom the entire Big East. But who cares about that? It's the 2000s, baby. You gotta look out for El Numbro Uno. Getting a better media deal? Check. More visibility? Check. Getting paid more? Cash that check, muchacho. But how about those records? After one of the most dominant runs in modern football history, winning seven conference titles and five national championships in the last 17 years, only being Bolt ineligible one time since joining the Big East in 1991, the Hurricanes have not won a single national championship or conference title since. They are regularly Bolt eligible, only missing eligibility four times in 20 years. However, is that why you joined the ACC? To go from being one of the most dominant teams in the sport to competing for the Russell Athletic Bowl? Virginia Tech fared a little better, rattling off four ACC championships between 2004 and 2010. But since then, the Hokies have fallen off. Again, they're regularly bowl eligible, only missing 
two times since they joined the ACC, but is that what you left the Big East for? Boston College joined the club in 2005, also abandoning the Big East after winning its 2004 conference championship. How's that going for them? The Eagles' all-time ACC record is 120 and 183 and four. Granted, some of those are from before they joined the conference, but you get the point. On to the next cycle. Oh boy, the 2010s. You're playing Battlefield 3, getting hooked in the MCU, and finding out how it feels to chew five gum. On the college football front, things are, well, things are getting real wacky. Thanks to Texas's constant girl bossing, the Big 12 was falling apart. The conference, which had formed out of a union between the Big 8 and pieces of the Southwest Conference, looked like its days were numbered. In 2011, old Big 8 schools in Nebraska and Colorado jumped to the Big 10 and Pac-12 respectively a move the Buffaloes would certainly never regret. You don't need me to tell you how strong each of these two teams were in their Big 12 days as their fans hold on to those memories like a door in the sinking of the Titanic. The Big 10 and Pac-12's desire in adding them largely revolved around their success in the field and prominence as football brands. And what did they get? Nebraska started off decent, getting bowl eligible in their first six years, but since 2017 they've yet to finish the season at 500. Not over 500, at 500. Out West, things fared far worse. Colorado, a team which had only missed bowl eligibility seven times since 1985, only became bowl eligible two times while they were in the pack, with one of those being a whopping 4-2 and two season during a shortened COVID year. These weren't the only teams to leave the Big 12 for greener pastures, as Missouri and Texas A&M joined Arkansas in the SEC in 2012. Neither of these teams were historic powerhouses with Missouri's most recent conference championship being in 1961, and Texas A&M's most recent national championship being in 1939, though they did have more recent success in conference championships with a run of dominance in the 90s. So, did the move to the SEC help them? Missouri came in swinging, reaching the SEC championship in 2013 and 2014, but coming up short each time. Including those years, the Tigers have only finished a season above 500 five times. The Aggies saw more success, only having missed a bowl game once in their time in the SEC along with getting a Heisman in 2012. But beyond that, they've yet to reach their goal of conference and national championships, all at the cost of tens of millions of dollars in coaching changes alone. In response to losing the four schools, the Big 12 stuck together and opted to add West Virginia from the collapsing Big East and former Southwest school TCU, reuniting them with old rivals like Texas Tech, Baylor, and UT. How'd it go for these two? Eastern Giant West Virginia, after rattling off six Big East championships in nine years, fell to the middle of the pack in their new home. Regularly reaching bowl eligibility, but not seeing anywhere near the same levels of success they had previously. TCU, however, wasn't hit as hard. After being left for dead following the dissolution of the Southwest Conference, program legend Gary Patterson led the Frogs to five conference titles, eight 10-plus win seasons, and an undefeated 2010 run culminating in a Rose Bowl victory over Wisconsin, leading to their eventual joining the Big 12 in 2012. Since joining the conference, TCU has stacked another four 10-plus win seasons, won a conference title in 2014, and has been in the discussion for the college football playoff multiple times finally breaking through in 2022 under new head coach Sonny Dykes and becoming the first Big 12 team to win a playoff game. Not Oklahoma, not UT, TCU. Now I know what you're thinking, this is a TCU account and this is clearly purple tinted glasses. But just stay with me because this will be important later. But first, the Big 12 wasn't the only conference adding and losing teams. Rapid fire time. 2014, Big 10 grabs Maryland from the ACC and Rutgers from the Big East. Before the move, both floated around the upper middle of the pack, with Rutgers winning the Big East Championship in 2012 and Maryland getting the ACC title in 01. After the move to the Big 10, both are regularly fighting just to reach bowl eligibility. In 2013, the ACC added Pittsburgh and Syracuse, followed by Louisville in 2014, all from the Big East. All three struggled to find any consistency in the new home, but enjoyed occasional flashes like Pitt winning the conference championship in 2021 and Louisville getting the first Heisman recipient in 2016 with Lamar Jackson. Neither Syracuse nor Louisville, who'd won Big East championships as recently as 2012, have returned to the same heights while in the ACC. The Pac-12 added Utah from the Mountain West to join Colorado in 2011. While the Buffalo struggled at just about every turn, the Utes enjoyed relative success, reaching the Pac-12 championship game five times and winning it in 2021 and 22 back-to-back, -back, only missing bowl eligibility three times. Just like TCU, their success marked a strange outlier in comparison to the other teams. So, what's going on here? This is what prompted me to make the video, because I haven't really seen anyone talking about this. The 
general vibe around it bounces between the teams just being unlucky, them losing their historic recruiting grounds, and of course, the ever-constant argument of conference supremacy. The idea that the reasons these teams struggled was because the conferences they joined are just flat out tougher and it's as simple as that. These have always seemed like a gross oversimplification or just straight up conference bias by the talking heads repeating the same points they get handed down by the studios. So I've got another theory. First, let me make something clear. College football is plagued by new age fans who think that winning championships and national titles is all that matters. In reality, the sport is and needs to be so much more than that. Teams need to be happy to win wacky bowl games, beat their rivals, and just have fun. So for most teams, they'd be perfectly happy being regular bowl competitors and having some marquee wins over the big boys every now and then like A&M. But the teams we're looking at here hold themselves to a standard of stacking up titles and national championship runs, either because of their historic success or because of the aspiration of their boosters. When Arkansas left the Southwest, they didn't do it to become an occasional bowl contender. They did it to continue their dominance. But across the board, each of these teams failed in their goals, with only a couple exceptions. Now, let's look at some similarities. The easy the easiest one is that the ones choosing to leave are all upper-level competitors in their old conferences. In most cases, they're not just competitors, they're perennial top dogs like Miami and Nebraska and West Virginia. These teams aren't looking for a place to finally find success, they're looking to continue the success they already have in a new home where they can rake in way more money. Something else these teams all have in common? When they left, they were already power teams from power conferences. These weren't teams from the Sun Belt or Conference USA rising the ranks and experiencing playing big boy football for the first time. Louisville from the Big East, Missouri from the Big 12, Arkansas from the Southwest. Ah, but keen-eyed viewers will notice that our two exceptions also break this norm. When TCU and Utah joined their new homes, they came from the Mountain West, a non-power conference. Editor's note, Granted, in the early 2000s, the Mountain West was stacked and warrants its own video, but I digress. Finally, when these teams leave their old conferences, they usually end up being on the geographic fringes of their new one, like Nebraska being the furthest west of the Big Ten, and West Virginia being on an island in the Big 12. Interestingly enough, the two teams that might call themselves exception to this curse of moving conferences, TCU and Utah, are also exceptions to this. When TCU joined the Big 12, the conference already had other Texas teams. When Utah joined the pack, they weren't the furthest east school because of the addition of Colorado, who, by the way, always felt like an outsider in the conference. Okay, so we've got three loose similarities. Teams that move aren't at the bottom of the barrel of their old leagues, they're moving from power conference to power conference, and they're geographic outsiders in their homes. So what does it mean? Here's what I got. Geography matters in college football. It's not just a figurative, it's cool to play your neighbors sense, but tangible in a viewable way. It seems to me that there's something about playing in somewhere that actually fits your geography that has real world results. Is this because of natural rivalries that come from when you're playing similar schools with fans that interact with you daily? Possibly. Is it because your recruiting is easier when you can focus on your backyard rather than trying to invade someone else's territory like Nebraska trying to go into the Midwest or Colorado trying to go on the West Coast? Could be. Is it because the money behind the scenes of athletic programs is more pressured to donate when the school is being compared to local regional rivals? Maybe it's none of these or maybe it's all of them. This is a very tricky thing to analyze because we're talking about an intangible thing leading to tangible results. Like there's some hidden element that's required for a team's success. Let's call it the give a damn factor. I believe that schools recognize this give a damn factor and attempt to remedy the situation, usually by creating artificial rivalries that really only exist in name, like the rumble for the Rockies between Colorado and Utah, or the battle line rivalry between Missouri and Arkansas. While I'm sure there's some people who really care about these games, and they do fit in geographic lines, do they raise the needle on the give a damn scale when compared to a school's historic regional rivals like Colorado Nebraska, Utah BYU, or Missouri Kansas? What about our two exceptions? What about their give a damn factor? Maybe it has something to do with their moves fitting in geographically, and that they're able to play teams they've always been around and formulate new rivalries as they elevate themselves into the power conference. In TCU's case, their move to the Big 12 felt less like a rising of the ranks and more like a return home because of them rejoining many of their old Southwest brothers like Baylor, Tech, and Texas. Would TCU have been as successful if they joined the Big 10 or the ACC? 
Probably not, because after the newness of playing Florida State or Michigan wears off, why would someone give a damn about playing Wake Forest or Illinois? Especially when they could be playing their neighbors like Oklahoma State and Baylor. Another solution schools have tried is to just drop enormous amounts of money on it, be it in stadium renovations, multiple coaching hiring and firings, or in this new era of NIL, recruiting the best class of players that money could buy. Still, that doesn't seem to have worked for the best examples of Texas A&M and Nebraska, two schools with the spending power of a small country. <laughs> They constantly have some of the highest rated recruiting classes, but that still hasn't accumulated on the field, thus leading me to conclude that the give a damn factor isn't something that you can buy, it's something that has to be earned. That begs the question, if a team can't create their own give a damn, then what's going to be the result of this next mass realignment? Based on this theory, let's go through each of the Power Four conferences and see whose give a damn is in trouble. The place it all started, the SEC. They're adding two teams in 2024, the Texas Longhorns and the Oklahoma Sooners. Element one, are they top dogs? Absolutely. Even if we discount Oklahoma's recent troubles and Texas's decade and a half of misery, the two were clearly the biggest brands in the Big 12 and regularly had top recruitment classes in the conference. Element two, are they from power conferences? Clearly yes. Cry your hearts out, Pac-12 fans. And you're it tonight! Three, are they geographic outsiders? Yes and no. With the SEC already having Texas A&M, UT will not be the only school in the Lone Star State. In fact, they'll be rejoining their Southwest Conference rivals in the Hogs and the Aggies, while maintaining their Red River rivals in Oklahoma. As for the Sooners, they're leaving their historic home in the Great Plains and going from a school in the center of their conference to being an outsider. They will keep their historic rivalry with Longhorns and rejoin their Big 8 foe, Missouri. Based on this, Texas should be able to expect more success than Oklahoma, as they fit geographically better and will maintain three traditional rivals. The Sooners look to be in trouble, and they're at risk of going the way of Nebraska in the Big Ten. In response to the OUUT departure, the Hateful Eight banded together and added four teams from the Group of Five level, UCF, Cincinnati, Houston, and BYU. On our three-factor test, the three AAC schools passed the first element as former top dogs of the old conference. BYU would pass, except for the fact that they're previously independent. None of the four passed the second element in being former power teams. If you're a fan of one of these schools, don't fret because, remember, the two outliers we discussed earlier didn't pass this element either, so you're in good company. As for the third element, the answer's mixed. BYU was on an island, but will soon be joined by Utah in the so-called Four Corner Schools. Cincinnati joins West Virginia in the northeastern wing of the conference, so maybe that'll help both of them mutually, though it is only two schools. UCF is in the worst position, as they're not only the only school in Florida, but the only school in the area. Their saving grace is that they joined alongside two of their old AAC foes. The school in the best position is Houston as they join an already existing Big 12 Texas footprint and are meeting back up with old Southwest Conference foes like Tech, Baylor, and TCU. This would indicate that BYU and Houston should experience the most success going forward, with Cincinnati's ambitions being questionable on their island alongside West Virginia and UCS's future being most in danger. However, if the mere fact of them rising from G5 to P4 is enough, maybe that'll counteract their geographic problems. Alongside these four, the conference will also add Colorado, Utah, Arizona, and Arizona State from the Pac-12. All four of these schools meet the second and third requirements, being Power 5 teams and fitting the Big 12's new Western footprint. This addition is shaping up to be more similar to the Southwest Big 8 merger than any individual movement of a team from one place to another. As for the first element, only Utah meets this criteria as the Arizonas and Colorado have struggled in comparison. Based on this, all four should experience success ranging from possible return to form in Colorado, reuniting with their old Big 8 foes, to maintaining the same status they had in the Pac-12 in the case of the Arizonas. This theory would also lead one to believe that Utah and BYU uniting in the same conference should be beneficial to both teams. The Midwestern giant really blew all this up by abandoning any sense of regionality with the addition of USC, UCLA, Washington, and Oregon in 2024. As with the four corner schools in the Big 12, this should be more similar to a pseudo-conference merger than any individual team's movement. Each of these four meet the standard of being top dogs and being from a former power conference as they are some of the most valuable brands and most successful teams of the defunct Pac-12. Geographically, the four fit within themselves as the entire Pac-12 coast is moving east together. Perhaps this will guarantee their long-term success in the Big Ten, or perhaps it'll mean that they'll all sink together. I think the results are going to be mixed, with one of them likely rising above the rest, but failing to make a spot at the top of the total
totem pole in the conference. As we were talking about earlier, will people in LA give a damn in seven years after the newness of playing Penn State wears off and they gotta get excited to play Purdue at 5 p.m. on a Friday? The All Coast Conference looks to be in the most precarious situation of them all. The league opted to add Pac-12 leftovers Stanford and Berkeley alongside G5 SMU. In analyzing these moves with our facts, things aren't looking pretty. First, none of these three could be considered perennial top dogs of their former homes, with SMU looking like the best. But even then, the Ponies only winning their first conference championship since the death penalty in the 80s, and only be able to do so after three AAC schools leave for the Big 12 isn't saying much. Second, both Cal and Stanford pass that they're moving from a power conference to power conference, unlike SMU. However, remember that both TCU and Utah found success in moving up the ladder, so maybe that's good news if you're a Mustang fan. But the third element is the real kicker here. If you didn't know, the ACC stands for the Atlantic Coast Conference. Atlantic Coast and they are taking in two teams from the California Bay Area and Dallas, Texas. Long story short, things aren't looking great for these newcomers. Maybe the Big Ten will be able to make their West Coast arm work with their hordes of money, resources, and a strong brand name. But the ACC? The conference has so little money that they're having to bring in SMU for free. Yes, free. All three teams are on islands in their new home, meaning that they'll have a hard time finding a footing in this strange new world. As for the California schools, they haven't really been holding themselves to the standard of playing high-level football recently, and fan support reflects this. So maybe they'll just be fine with making a bowl game whenever they can, and the occasional upset over the Clemson's of the world. No doubt SMU is planning to throw money at the problem, and I could see a world in which they could even have one of the better recruitment classes in the conference year in and year out. But how did that work for Nebraska? How did that work for the Aggies? Unless the conference were able to expand more and bolster the region with teams like UTSA or Tulane, history shows it's going to be a bad time in Dallas. <laughs> Nothing bad ever happens to the Kennedys! Ah! But what do you think? Maybe you have your own analysis, or you know the real reason behind the give a damn factor. Leave a comment or message me on Twitter, it's linked below. I'm just starting the channel up, so please like and subscribe if you'd want to see more. Thanks, and as always, I will catch you on the next one.